the Cotswolds, a unique area of southwest England full of gorgeous countryside with the most spectacular views. Oh, look at this. But I would say that I live here. <laughs> this is the life. I'm poet Pam Ayres. Oh, it's so nice to be back. And in this new series, I'm discovering more delights in my lush part of the world. Just look at this. Oh, gosh. It's fit for a prince, I would say. <laughs> You're a genius. I can't deny it. <laughs> but this time, I'm heading further afield, too, to discover amazing places. It takes my breath away, really. Absolutely spectacular. Look at the colours. And fascinating stories just beyond the Cotswolds' borders. This is what he actually looked like. Gosh. The only reason it's here is because your ancestors looked after it for 3,000 years. So join me as I make new friends. Well, welcome to Longbeat House. Who are passionate about the places they call home. Come in, darling. It's you know, very inviting. Yeah, you'll like it. I would sort it. I don't know what that means. You might just recognise a few of them. Don't, don't say don't. that, Lucy. <laughs> I'm lowering the tone of your programme, Pam. Cheers. 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 Cheers, Malvern. Today, I visit one of Britain's most iconic landmarks for a magical experience. Look, the stone and the sun and the mist. It's awesome, isn't it? I taste Cheltenham's famous spa waters and get a nasty shock. Excuse me, Wally go around the corner and erupt. And I'm in the wilds of Oxfordshire on the search for one of my favourite furry friends. Look at that nice round bottom. I haven't seen one of those for a long time. <laughs> now, the Cotswolds is a place you've probably already heard of. But just in case you're scratching your head wondering exactly where to find it, let me show you. You'll need to head to southwest England, where nestling between Bath, Cheltenham and Oxford is an area of gorgeous rolling countryside which stretches across six counties. And my trip today starts in Gloucestershire, near the town of Tetbury, at one of my favourite places in the whole of the Cotswolds. When I was little, we had a massive English elm tree right next to our house. And my dad, Stan, put a swing up for us and it was a real good swing. And we loved it. My sister Jean and I, we played on the swing day in, day out. We were as happy as could be. And the farmer came and put a barbed wire fence across the rotten swine. Ever since then, I've loved my leafy friends which is why I'm so excited about where I am today. The National Arboretum at Westonburt near Tetbury in Gloucestershire is home to over 15,000 trees, including rare and endangered species. It's one of the most important and breathtaking plant collections in the world and somewhere I really look forward to visiting. It's so lovely to be back here, Mark, especially with all these mesmerising colours. And today I'm in for a treat. Westonburt's curator, Mark Ballard, has given me a special personal tour, so I'm very lucky. Uh, tell me a bit about the history of it. I know these things don't just suddenly appear. Who, who was behind it, Mark? So it all was developed and created from scratch by a guy called Robert Stainer Holford almost 200 years ago now. Wow. It is breathtakingly beautiful. And it seems to be planted in layers. Is that right? Yes, it's all contrived. It's meant to be beautiful. It's this what we call a picturesque landscape style. So Robert Stainer Holford and indeed his son, Sir George, they were inspired by a guy called W.S. Gilpin. He was a landscape painter to oh. landscape gardener. So they laid everything out very carefully and there are sort of key principles behind that landscape style. Oh, really? These marvellous views haven't changed since Victorian times. And now the responsibility for maintaining the Holford's vision has passed on to Mark and his team. 
Everything's got to be mixed up. You've got to have that lovely variety of shape, colour, texture, form. There's also got to be intrigue or intricacy. So we can't see beyond that serpentine oh, bend or where we've come from. No, look at this. Look at the colour. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, it's breathtaking, isn't it? Everywhere you look, it's so lovely. But the real joy for me is in the incredible variety of trees. Oh. Let's just go in here and have a look at this beautiful tree. On my walk, I have discovered my favourite tree in the world. This is the pocket handkerchief tree, or Davidia involucrata, and I just love it. It's got this flower like a little tassel, but it's surrounded by this beautiful bract. A bract is a leaf that isn't green, and when the tree is covered in them, it, it flutters in this lovely, dainty way. This is a spectacular one, Mark. How old is it? It was planted in 1920, so it's exactly 102 years old. 102. It looks exquisite, doesn't it? It certainly all does. a flutter. With 600 acres of trees and shrubs from all over the world, Westenbert's a real champion of conservation work. I'm teaming up with Penny Jones, who's celebrated for her vast experience as a propagator. Lots of people that, you know, once an arboretum is planted, they think that's it, but you've yeah. got to keep on renewing, having different age structures for generations to enjoy in the future. Today, Penny's taken a risk by asking me to repot a very special plant called a rhododendron unanensi. This is a darling little plant, Penny. It's got dear little pink bobbles on the end of the stamens and a little peachy stripe. Tell me about this plant. Why is it here and where's it come from? The original plant, the parent plant, was collected in Sichuan in China oh. in 1992. So it was a wild collected plant. Did you grow it from seed or a cutting? No, this was grown from a cutting. I was quite lucky, actually, the, the parent plant died and I'd taken some cuttings the year before. So this is one of its progeny. It's beautiful. These gorgeous plants can grow up to 12 feet tall if they're looked after. And it's a long trip to China for another one, so I better get it right. There you go. Come on, my little friend. Now, it's got to be level with the top of the pot, isn't it? So I'm going to scoop out a bit of this and just do a, a test. Does that look about right, that Penny? Looks perfect, does it? And I always just sort of do the, the label check. So, yep. yep good. So that's got to be level with the top of the pot. Take a bit more out. There you are, darling. You look very smart. Not you, Penny. I'm talking to the talking to the rhododendron. Yeah, you look gorgeous. This particular rhododendron was first brought to the UK in the late 1800s. And I feel quite maternal getting this little plant started in life. But at my final stop, I can see the real star attractions, which have been growing here for decades. At over 100 feet tall, these giant ladies tower over the whole of the Arboretum. And I think they're truly awesome. So, Mark, we're standing here by these three statuesque trees, and I know they're called the Three Sisters, but I don't know anything about them. Please, will you enlighten me? They are amazing, aren't they? They were planted in 1861, at giant redwoods all the way from California. Robert Stainer Holford, the founding father, he passed on great wealth in the Arboretum to his son, Sir George, and his three daughters got a tree each. Well, the son received the entire estate and the three sisters had a tree planted. That's it, yeah. And did they grumble into their beards about their inheritance? Um, who knows, but <laughs> believe it or not, at the time, this is quite exciting because these are amongst the very first giant redwoods brought into the oh, UK, really? so they were oh. quite special trees. Yes, I see. I wouldn't mind being bequeathed a giant redwood here at Westenbert. It's one of my favourite places in the world, and I always discover something new. It really is good for the soul. There's something so special and lovable about trees, I think. They give you certain feelings of being impressed or sad or thoughtful or spiritual. Yeah, they hit you right there. They're just magical things. I love them.
coming up. I experience the magic of one of Britain's most historic landmarks. It has a very, very special atmosphere, so uh, I feel quite overwhelmed by it, to be honest. And I'm impressed by Cheltenham's rich Georgian grandeur. Look, oh, what beautiful decoration. Look at those lovely rosettes on the ceiling. It's so intricate, isn't it? This morning, I've left my cosy bed exceedingly early to venture just beyond the Cotswolds. I've headed south to Salisbury Plain in Wiltshire to visit one of the most mystical and iconic landmarks in the whole of Britain. I'm here before the sun comes up and the larks are singing. I'm approaching a place which um, I'm very excited to see, and it's Stonehenge. Just walking up to it like this, it, it makes you feel um, awestruck, really, because you don't know why it's here or who put it there and what it was for and how on earth they did it. With its famous megaliths, or standing stones, Stonehenge is the largest and most complex prehistoric stone circle in the world. It's now a protected World Heritage Site, and I'm delighted to have been given special permission to be here, and I realise what a privilege it is. I've seen this on picture postcards a thousand times, but if you're actually here, it's different. Here, on my own, just before the sun comes up and strikes the stone, it has a very, very special atmosphere. So uh, I feel quite overwhelmed by it, to be honest. When you're actually in among these stones, the grandeur of them is awesome. I feel all kinds of emotion. I feel full of wonder how anybody could have got those whopping great stones up on top and balanced them and carved them. I can't imagine how you'd do that, how those ancient people did that. To this day, no one knows exactly how Stonehenge was built or what it was used for. But for thousands of years, people have come here drawn by the sun, which aligns with the stones at different times of the year. And now I'm walking in those same ancient footsteps. Well, this is it. I'm waiting for the sun to come up and strike the stone behind me. It's gonna be a really special moment. As the sun moves into position with the heel stone, its dramatic silhouette can be seen against a radiant sky. And now I can understand why Stonehenge is considered such a spiritual place. Look, the stone and the sun and the mist. It's awesome, isn't it? Bleary-eyed as I am, I wouldn't have missed this for the world. And I want to find out more about this extraordinary monument. Hello, Susan. Good morning. I'm really nice pleased. To meet you. Yeah, it's lovely to meet you as well. Dr. Susan Greeny is an archaeologist specialising in British prehistory. It must be a dream job to be here. It is, yes. I am very privileged After because you. I get to come inside Stonehenge on a regular basis. Yeah. I'm hoping she'll be able to reveal some of the secrets of this sacred site. Can you see there's a bank here? Yes, and I a bank can. here. Yeah. So this is the entrance to Stonehenge, is it? Yeah. yeah. Susan, can I ask you a question which you, as an archaeologist, will never have heard in your entire life? What's it for? What was its purpose? Stonehenge is a prehistoric temple. It's a religious monument that is built to align with the sun. And so we believe that people were coming here at midsummer 
and at midwinter okay. to celebrate and to conduct rituals related to the turning of the year, to the seasons. But we don't know exactly what happened here. We don't obviously have any records. No. And archaeologists, when they've excavated the site, have found it very clean. It's almost like a sacred space. Um, so that doesn't give us many clues no. as to exactly what was taking place. Tell me about the site. The earliest part is actually this ditch that we stood near. I see, I would have walked straight past this ditch. I didn't <laughs> yeah. realise it was so doesn't significant. Much, does it? It's the henge of Stonehenge. This is the henge bit. What does henge mean? It then? means a circular enclosure, just like this. And this was dug out about 500 years before the stones got put up in the middle of the site. And it's about four and a half thousand years ago that the stones oh, got put up. Wow. Oh, four and a half thousand years. Gosh. Should we go inside and yeah. have a little bit more look at the stones? Let's. OK. It's amazing to think that these stones were erected at around the same time as the Egyptians were building the pyramids. The massive stones that form the main structure are a type of sandstone block, typically weighing around 20 tonnes and standing up to 22 feet tall. Look at these. You get the scale of it here, don't you? First thing I find myself thinking is, how on earth did they get these massive stones into those positions? Can you enlighten me? Yes. Good. So, the large stones, the sarsen stones, yep. were brought about 20 miles away from the Marlborough Downs. Right. And we okay. think that they used sledges to drag the stones over land. Once they got them to site, they were working and shaping them using hammer stones. They only had rough stone tools to help them, so it's incredible what these prehistoric architects achieved. What is really amazing is the fact that they have lined this entirely enormous monument with these great big stones, so the sunrise is framed very carefully between the stones, and that's astonishing. And there's nothing simple about the design. Stonehenge is a masterpiece of engineering. Stonehenge is unique in that it's got joints, just like Lego. Oh, so I if say. you see at the top of this stone here. Yeah, so I was looking at that, it's got a bobble on the top. Yeah, that's right. So yep. that stone there is the tallest one on the site, okay. and it shows you what's on top of each of the uprights is this knob or tenon, yep. which yep. fits into a hollow on the horizontal stones or the lintels on top. Oh, so I you can see. see here, this is actually the lintel that fell down, and you can see it's got these hollows. These are where they would have slotted onto the top, so they're just engineered to create these very precise joints. Isn't these... that clever yeah. to do that with a massive stone? But how did they get that up there, Susan? Well, we don't know exactly, but we think they probably use timber scaffolding, just levering up the stone bit by bit to get to the right height. Oh, it's I just see. a huge engineering project using many, many people to create this really spectacular space. It must have taken a small army of people to raise even one of these stones. And I bet they never imagined that visitors would still be coming to admire their work over four and a half thousand years later. What do you think is the magic of Stonehenge? Why do people still come? I think Stonehenge is seen as an icon of prehistory. It's somewhere that's so old that it's just a marvel to come and wonder at the engineering skill yeah. and what, what made people build such an extraordinary monument. And I think people find it gives them a sense of perspective. You know, we have very busy modern lives, but actually we're kind of fleeting, really, in the yeah, whole sweep of human Every history. Every score years and ten yeah. is nothing, is it? So it, it's kind of a place that people, I think, can come and get a sense of perspective and, and just wonder um, at the achievements of the past. Well, my visit here has certainly given me plenty to think about. It's been incredible and genuinely inspiring. From the magnificent site of Stonehenge on Salisbury Plain, I'm heading back over the border to one of the Cotswolds' most majestic places. I'm on my way to Cheltenham, which is a rather special spot as it's one of the best preserved Georgian towns in the whole of Britain. 
Today, whether it's the posh shops or the world-famous horse racing festival, Cheltenham is a big draw, attracting up to two million visitors every year. And it's also the perfect place to sit and watch the world go by and have a nice cup of coffee. It emerged as a famous spa town in the early 1700s, after word spread about the healing powers of its natural spring. Even King George III paid a visit in 1788. Now, the king was suffering from what was described at the time as a bilious attack, and the doctor prescribed a visit to Cheltenham to take the waters, and that royal patronage meant that the fame of the Cheltenham waters spread worldwide, and it became a global phenomenon Wealthy visitors flocked to its new spas, eager to find cures for their ailments and afflictions. But soon, a newcomer sprang up, which threatened to outdo Cheltenham. This impressive building is Pitville Pump Room, which was completed in 1830 on land that then lay outside the town. And it was meant to be the centrepiece of a new town that would steal Cheltenham's thunder. Hello, Pam. Hello. Welcome to Pitville. Thank you very much. I'm meeting up with Anne Rachel, who now gives visitors an insight into life in this marvellous Regency building. It's very grand. Well, isn't it, it is, isn't it? Look yes. All these colossal pillars. Wow. Look. Oh, what beautiful decoration. Look at those lovely rosettes on the ceiling. Oh, I know, they're exquisite, aren't they? they are. And look at the lovely uh, decorative plasterwork. I love that. I know. It's so intricate, isn't it? Yes. Now, I have been to Pitville Pump Room before, but the last time I was a little preoccupied. And Rachel, it's very nice for me to be here and not feel panic-stricken, because the last time I was here, which was a long time ago, I was doing a performance and I always use a radio mic and the dome didn't like it, so the sound was terrible and people were saying, can't hear ya! And then people bought a ticket and they got upset and it was a bit of a nightmare. So it's very nice to be back under these calm circumstances and talking to you. Now tell me, cos it's so grand and imposing, how did this building come about? Well, quite extraordinary, really. There was a man called Joseph Pitt, who was a self-made man, yep. who uh, started off life just holding horses for the cost oh. of a penny. And he managed My to gosh. make money and he bought land north of Cheltenham and he had this vision for a town named after him, Pittville, because he was called yeah. Joseph Pitt. Wow. Pitt may have come from humble beginnings, but his palatial pump house definitely wasn't for the hard up. Like today's exclusive spas, entry cost a fortune, but you certainly got your money's worth. What kind of thing happened here? Because it's not just a spa, is it? No, no, not at all. What? People did come to take the waters, but yep. there were ball dances, there were concerts, there were firework displays outside. But the one I like the best is there were huge breakfasts in here. Breakfast? Yeah, great trestle tables down oh, the length, wow. and everybody came in what? and sat down and had a breakfast. Well, they were certainly feast breakfasts, oh. several courses, probably cold meats and that kind of thing, breakfast. Oh, and devilled kidneys yes, and all that kind of stuff. absolutely, all that kind of lovely stuff. It sounds oh, grand, doesn't it? Wouldn't you like to be part of it, yeah? Well, I'm more of a fruit and yogurt girl myself, to be honest. Coming up, I admire Pitville's palatial parklands. Just look at this. Oh, gosh, look. And I don my wellies and waders. What do you think? In search of an elusive furry fellow. Oh, that look. Is. There's my old friend, the water bowl. Look at that nice round bottom. I haven't seen <laughs> one of those for a long time. Welcome back to the Cotswolds and beyond. I'm visiting Cheltenham's Pitville Pump Room to explore the history behind the town's famous spa waters. And I'm eager for my guide, Anne Rachel, to finally let me have a taste. What about the water that brought people here in the first place? Um, where, where, where can you get a guzzle of that? 
Well, the water came from a pump, which is right through here. Is it that grandiose construction I can see? It is very grand. It is, Very isn't it? special. What did people think the water would do for them then? I think they thought it was going to cure everything and anything, whether <laughs> it was boils or gout or pneumonia or you name it, they thought it would be cured. Is it true? Does it have beneficial effects? Well, I've no idea. It's certainly very nasty, is and I are? think people think the nastier, the more likely it is to do some good. Yeah, the nastier, the more <laughs> beneficial. The trouble is, this stuff is a cocktail of salt water and iron. So delicious, it ain't. And just as I start thinking my luck's in... Oh, look, it says, please do not drink the spa water. Yes, we have a little problem with it at the moment. We are getting it sorted out. <laughs> right. But I didn't want you to miss out. So here is a recreation of one for you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Why am I not looking forward to this? Here we go. Let's have a taste. It's really gross. Excuse me while I go around the corner and erupt. Crikey, I don't think even the most dire illness would persuade me to try that again. Feels like it's time for some fresh air. Just look at this. Oh, gosh, look. Oh, it's all the way round, as far as you can see, this beautiful sort of bowl effect. But it's it really gives you the position of Cheltenham. So, Anne Rachel, is this what the view would have been like when it, it was created? Well, yes, it is more or less unchanged with the grass and then the lake. And then, of course, beyond the lake was the limit of where the poorer people could come up to. They could only stand and stare. Oh, really? So the rich were in the inner confines and the poor were excluded? It was of its time, and what a good thing today. Anybody can come here. I know anybody can come and enjoy it. It's absolutely wonderful to be able to see it from up here. And Rachel, thank you very much for your patience and time today and for telling me all about the history of the pump room. I've really enjoyed it. It's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> Well, from one of Cheltenham's most famous spas, I'm heading to much more familiar waters closer to home. I'm travelling across Oxfordshire to Letcombe Brook in search of one of my favourite furry friends. When I was small, there were lots of little waterways. There was the little river Ock and Bow Brook, and along all of them, you could guarantee to see waterfalls. These nice little faces sitting on the bank in front of their tunnels, munching away at reeds and grasses. And now, they've just about vanished. And it's really sad. I think they're part of the lovely chain of wildlife, and I really miss them. The water vole was famously depicted by the character Ratty in one of my favourite books of all time, The Wind in the Willows. And these days, there are still a few places like this gorgeous little brook where they can be spotted. So I'm meeting a man who's on a mission to protect Ratty and his river-dwelling friends. So this is where you've done all this work. Yeah, Mark. yeah, lots of clearing here. You can yeah, see the can see. the willow that we pollarded. Yeah. Mark Bradfield works for the local wildlife trust here at Letcombe Brook. Along with his team of volunteers, he's working hard to help water voles and plenty of other wildlife to thrive here. What happened to them? Where have they gone and why? The main reason is mink. So American mink were brought over for fur farming so they're not a native species, and they escaped from the fur farms, and they just spread through the environment, and they're able to fit into the burrows, and they kill the water voles. That is the number one That's driver it. of the decline. But habitat loss, pollution, that can also be a problem. So what are you doing here on Letcombe Brook to try and help the poor old water vole? 
So we've done an awful lot of habitat work. We've been reducing shade, for instance. If we look at this bit here, yeah. we've got a really nice luxuriant vegetation on the banks. Yeah. So they need that, that wide band of vegetation for food and for cover. And then the other thing is keeping on top of mink. So we monitor for mink. This is an elusive little animal, though, yeah. isn't it, the vole? So how do you monitor their progress or otherwise? The best way to do it is to use trail cameras. Ah, So we can put right. them in position and leave them. I can come back two or three weeks later and see what's oh, shown up. I'd love to have a look. Oh, I'd be delighted to show you, yeah. Right, let's, let's... go and see. OK. It makes me very happy to think that these mammals, which were so in decline, have returned to Letcombe Brook. And I can't wait to see their little faces. Oh, that look, is. there's my old friend, the water vole. They're big, aren't they, Mark? Much bigger than the other voles. They look at that nice round bottom. I haven't seen <laughs> one of those for a long time. See, he's just happily sat on the edge of the bank there, munching away on what looks like brook lime, I think that is. Oh, he's doing a bit of tree fell in there. <laughs> That's it, a bit of a mini beaver there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so nice. I mean, they do, to be fair, look a bit ratty, don't they, if, if you don't know? If you just saw they... the back end. Yeah. yeah. Oh, look, what's this? He's got some yeah. apple. Yeah, they love a bit of apple. Do they? Yeah. yeah. Oh, look at that. Oh, I can taste that apple. <laughs> Those big front teeth. Yeah. Oh, it's so nice to see them. I wish they were as prevalent as they were when I was young. Oh, fingers crossed we can get them back that it. way yeah, eventually. Yeah, I hope so. It's been a real treat to see my old friends. But I'm not just here to admire from afar. What do you think? <laughs> I feel suitably intrepid, and I'm about to go in and take the plunge. I'm joining Mark on a survey of the brook, another way he and his team of volunteers can monitor the activity of the water voles. Yeah, can I have your Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. if you stick your pole down in there too. That's it. Hang on, yeah. right, I got it. Thank yeah. you very much. But finding my river legs is harder than it looks. Oh, Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> very elegant. As we make our way along the bank, it's not long before Mark spots a telltale sign. You can see some droppings there, actually. So if you look, can you see the dark oh, yes, green? yes, I can. Yeah, they look like little Tic Tacs. Exactly, yeah. size and shape of a Tic Tac, but not as tasty. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> but, uh, That's a revolting thing to say. <laughs> they just sort of mark the territory, at the oh, little, little patch of droppings. Yeah, just... so there's not actually a burrow there, but they've probably been sat You're there feeding. This, this stretch of the stream is occupied. That's it. Yeah. It's wonderful to think that water voles are back inhabiting this very bank. And just a bit further up, there are even more signs that Ratty, who's really a vole, is in residence. Yeah, we can see there's a little bit of a run under the bank oh, here. Oh, yeah, I can see. A little where the, ledge where yep, they go along. Uh, uh, and here's an interesting bit. So there's a really nice sign for water vole is where you find bits of vegetation that have been bitten off. And I don't know why, but they bite things off at this nice 45-degree oh, angle. Do they? Yeah, it's very distinctive of water bowls. That's so. a good indicator, then. Yep. And if you have a look up under there, yeah. there is more vegetation that all stashed look. away. Oh, look, that's a picnic. We Imagine wouldn't even this. notice them, would we, probably, if nope. you sat there oh, no. munching right. away. That's my recollection of them. They're going along the brook when I was a kid and just seeing them sitting there with their cheeks full yeah. and munching away and not a care in the world. Exactly. Ah, oh, well, it's just my luck that we haven't spotted any today. But at least the camera traps are proof that he and his mates are thriving here. And it's thanks to the great work of Mark and his team at Letcombe Brook that its water voles will hopefully be safe and sound for many years to come. Coming up, I admire an 80s rock star's amazing home. I mean, this garden's got everything, hasn't it? The beautiful River Avon. And I've a special tribute to one of my favourite spots in the Cotswolds. I love the shifting canopy, the life that it supports. Welcome back to the Cotswolds and beyond. My final trip takes me to the elegant market town of Pershaw in the county of Worcestershire. 
On the surface, it might appear peaceful and serene with its beautiful Georgian buildings and magnificent abbey. But I'm actually here to meet one of its rowdier residents, who really knows how to rock. Victoria? Come on in! Come in at I know. It's very nice to meet you. I'm sorry about the weather. Come on yeah, and get dry. Toya Wilcox shot to fame in the 1980s with a string of top 40 hits and flamboyant haircuts to her name. Four decades on, she's busier than ever and still touring all corners of the UK. This girl from Birmingham first fell in love with Pershaw when she was just a teenager after weekend trips away here with her parents. What a wonderful garden. I'm not just saying that, it is the most spectacularly beautiful garden. And looking at her amazing mansion, it's no wonder that she and her husband, who's also a musician, have made it their home. I love your use of mirrors because it's quite a narrow garden, but the mirrors make it look so lovely and wide. Traditionally, it's an orchard garden. Is it? Plum trees, apple trees, pear trees, uh, and those don't live forever. And we've no. been here for 21 years, so what we've done is just completely replanted it over the years. I see. In fact, everywhere you look or step, there's something that makes you feel extra special and different. Look the, at this lovely sculpture. You've yeah. got beautiful sculptures. That's who is he? Do we know who he is? Uh, that's Althea Wynne, and we just call him the Horseman. Well, that's a jolly good day. Look at these lovely brick paths. Did you put these in? Yes, lovely these are handmade Evesham brick. It's quite um, an interesting combination, isn't it? You being a punk rocker, and then this palatial garden and lovely home in Pershaw and quite a surprising match. Well, punk rock is, was very street and still is very street level, but I have to say, most of the punk rockers I know live in mansions. Do <laughs> <laughs> We work very hard. You know about touring, so when we get home, we just want to be here. Mm. So we buy plants, we buy things that we want to see. Some are just tiny little kind of iris plants, mm. or they could be magnolias, which we planted just before lockdown. With sculptures and arbors, Toya's created a lovely, calm oasis. And if I wasn't already consumed with envy, right at the bottom is the most stunning view. I mean, this garden's got everything, hasn't it? It is. It's, it's absolutely got beautiful. everything. Look, the beautiful River Avon, all laid out before us. It's not rock and roll, but the River Avon is known for pleasure cruising. And the only way to properly appreciate this picturesque waterway is by boat. This is such a beautiful river with its weeping willows and all these lovely wide reaches. Do you use the river much, Toya? All the time. When I was a child, my father had a boat, so every weekend was spent on this river. Now I try and get on the river at least one day a week with my kayak. Oh, I say. Oh, I'm envious. And as soon as I get on the river, all your troubles melt away. What I find so beautiful is this olive green water and then looking up to see all these lovely fluffy clouds and the sparkle of the sun on the river. It's so gorgeous. Around this corner, I can see a habitation toy. Now, where's this? This is Wyermill Club. So this is a caravan and a boating club. It's the place Toya used to spend every weekend with her family. But when I was very, very young, 62 years ago, you could sail here as well. By the time I was 13, I was winning sailing awards here. Were you? Sailing. Oh, I'm terribly impressed. And she wasn't averse to risking life and limb. I used to canoe under that tunnel 
and go and play on the workings of the mill. That sounds terrifying. Yeah. That sounds like the world's worst thing to do to me. They couldn't stop us. We were banned oh, from doing it. We were very straight naughty. down there. Clearly, Toya's rebellious streak started early. So we would cross the weir. It's a miracle you're still alive. We'd go and play on Devil's Island and brighten the living daylights out of each other. <laughs> What an idyllic childhood you must have had here. And an idyllic 20-something, because when I was really, really famous, I could come here and be anonymous. Yeah. No one knew I was no. here. We uh, even spent part of our honeymoon here on the boat. Did you? Yeah. That was nice. That's a great place to spend a honeymoon. And as we disembark for a closer look... This is beautiful to I... be back. The brick-built mill, narrowboats and caravans are still much the same as when Toya was a child. You've got very happy memories here. I loved it here. Yeah. This is the place I first heard the Beatles. I first heard Jimi Hendrix here because there was such a community of kids. Yeah. We shared music, we shared sweets, we did share alcohol on a Saturday night. I mean, we were generally very, very naughty. Oh, look, there's a duck and little ducklings as well. Oh. Thank you so much for showing us your part of the world. And I can see why you love it so much. It's very special. Yeah. And thank you for sharing it with me. Cheers. Yay! <laughs> Well, what a wonderful way to end my trip around the Cotswolds and beyond. I've had an unforgettable time, from witnessing that gorgeous sunrise at Stonehenge, to marvelling at the amazing work being carried out to protect one of my favourite little mammals. But there's one place I always love to return to, and here's my little poem about the beauty of Western Bird. They can keep their concrete cities, the racket and the fumes, the overcrowded thoroughfares, the overheated rooms. I love a silent forest, the peacefulness complete, its seasons ever changing and its breathing ever sweet. I love the shifting canopy, the life that it supports, from crow to caterpillar, the thousand different sorts the flowers in their beauty, the summer's cavalcade. Oh, they can keep their concrete cities. I'll just sit here in the shade. Next time, I visit Highclere Castle, a stately home that's become a TV star in a smash hit series. When people come in, they must imagine themselves in Downton Abbey that Carson might come in carrying a tea Cup of coffee, yes, yes of definitely. Coffee. Yeah. <laughs> I joined TV star Anne Diamond for an emotional trip back to her Malvern childhood home. I'd forgotten how proud I was of oh. Malvern. I mean, this is such a wonderful reminder. And I enjoy all the fun of the fair yeah. on a seaside trip to Western Supermare. And you can see that next Friday at 8. Continuing his high-altitude adventure through the Pyrenees, Michael Portillo takes in stunning views from a famous observatory, brand new Tuesday at 9. Coming up, Dan Walker and the team are following in the footsteps of legends, digging for treasure tonight in the Scottish Lowlands. That's brand new next. <laughs>